Jen, you leading? No, you're leading. No, no. <laughs> We're live. That's good. Who's uh, who's up today? All right, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Can we do this? Like, so it's me and Jen, and then we're going to do a little off between these. Okay, others. you and Jen. Okay, <laughs> Chip, we're out. No, no, no. You guys are going to go, and then we're going to play the winner. So rock, paper, scissors. One, two. You got to go play with me. <laughs> ready? Come on, Jen. You just cheated. All right, I won. <laughs> um, so Jen and then whoever whoever wins here, you guys got to play too. All right, right. Oh, we got to play. Oh, we got. Yeah. One, side two, 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 three. Sideline. <laughs> oh, you got me. So it's me okay, and Jen. So, so it's between you two. Since you lost, one of you two, whoever loses, is going to lead this call. Great. There All we right. go. <laughs> ready? One. Two, three. Three. <laughs> yeah, <it's cool>. <laughs> Ladies are going to lead. Jen, oh. lead. <laughs> welcome, everybody, to the call, Jen. Let's roll. Yeah, welcome, everybody, to Coach's Corner. Um, we're having a little bit of fun before we get started today, and I'm glad you guys joined us. Um, what these calls look like is an opportunity for you to, to hop on. You have four coaches here to ask any question that you want to ask about what's going on in your business and, and get answers from people who are in this day to day. We were just talking about how we're at an advantage because we're coaching companies that are going through this on a daily basis and we're going through this with you in our own business. So let's get it kicked off. Um, if you have any questions, you can type those in the chat box. So the chat box on Zoom, if you go to your Zoom window with your mouse, click the little chat button and you can send us a, a question that you want us to ask in that chat box. So if you're joining us today, I see a few familiar faces. Um, go ahead and type a Y in the chat box for yes. You're ready to go. You're ready to get started. Just type a Y in that chat box. Thank you so much, Andy. I like, I like you following directions. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Chip. Great. All right. We are ready to get started. Um, so let's, yeah, Chip says why with a, with a W H Y you guys are on fire today. Okay. So Friday. what? It's Friday. Somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Team, what questions did, have you been hearing, uh, this past week coming from the members that you work with? Who wants to go first? I'm going to call on Chip. Sure, I'll go start. Um, I, I've had this question quite a bit. Um, is it okay to start selling, actively selling again? So what are, what are, what are you hearing about that? Are you hearing that question? And what, what, are, what are you advising your members and clients uh, to do out there in the field, Mark? Uh, Chip, you, you somewhat muted, broke up there, so I, I, I think I heard the question as, nope. Is it okay to start selling again, actively? Interesting. Can you not hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. You said we're muted. Um, you know, um, can we actively start selling? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we, we've been working with our members about what is it that you can be selling, right? If there's certain things that perhaps you couldn't be, um, then uh, are you looking at what are the opportunities to be, you know, everybody's heard a lot of pivoting, uh, changing, or taking some of the components that you might have and using them for different purposes. Um, I was talking with a, a member, you know, who in the past had made, uh, they'd made alcohol, all right, they, they'd made uh, uh, beer, and they took that alcoholic product, and turned it into hand sanitizer, because that's a key component. So, yes, you can be selling, you know, uh, anything at this time that, uh, uh, you know, it might be different than what you sold before, but, you know, look at what are the possibilities. Andy? I think it depends on uh, what you what your product or solution or service might be, right? So if you're selling tickets to a gathering for a thousand people in a field where you're going to be sleeping overnight, <laughs> you might have a tough time, and you may be looked at as that's really stupid for you to do that. Um, but if you've got anything whatsoever that serves another human being in a positive way, 
um, not selling it is a disservice to humanity, period. So you better be. Um, and if somebody looks at you as, and says, you shouldn't be doing that right now, um, they're probably not somebody that, that you, that is additive anyway. I mean, I once heard um, the CEO of GoDaddy, um, you guys all remember GoDaddy, Chip, I know you do. Remember their, their advertising used to be, you know, scanty, scantily clad females for the most part in all of their advertising. Um, and Bob Parsons was the guy's name. And he built that into a billion dollar industry or sold it for a billion dollars. And he, he got on stage and he said, you know, I've learned over time that I can only please about 85% of my audience. There's about 15% in his case, because he made the choice to, he said 15% of the people on the planet hate me. It's not even a, Hey, you shouldn't be selling that. It was like actively sending him hate mail and pipe bombs in his you know, mailbox and stuff. So he said, what I've learned in doing that is my job is to just piss off the 15% faster. <laughs> like the faster I piss them off, the faster the 85%, uh, you know, come on, you know, love what we do. So I think the message there is, yes, you better go sell. Uh, if you have anything that serves humanity in any way, form or, uh, form or fashion, it's a disservice not to. And there are going to be people who look at you crossways just because you're doing that and get used to it. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? I think the, the lens that we should be looking at this through as business owners is we get to do this again. We get to, we get to, not we have to, from a building perspective, you get to rebuild your offering, rebuild your message, rebuild your sales funnel, whatever that looks like for you. And, and many people have pivoted what they're selling. Um, I think in order to get ahead of the economy opening back up, you have to start selling now and get really comfortable with selling it. And it's all about the product you're selling and the message that you're selling it with to make sure that it's with empathy um, and that it's, you know, with integrity, which I, you know, we don't have, haven't seen any big issues with that with the people we work with, right? It's really about that perspective. You get to go build this. You, you don't have to go build this. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and, and to piggyback on that, I think selling right now is actually absolutely imperative for the, not only the health of your organization, but there are people who need what you have depending on what it is. To me, the, the piece of selling that's the most important right now is not if you're doing it, it's how you're doing it. It's the message, it's the tactics, um, how you're approaching your market. Are you overtly pitching? Um, are you soft selling? It all, it's, it's all gonna depend on who you are and, and what your markets are and who your audiences are, but absolutely, it's time to get the economy back moving um, in, 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 the, in a non-political way uh, and, and get, the, 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 get our companies back to uh, a healthy state. And we have to do that by creating revenue. So we have some- It's also positive, it's also po positive energy, right? Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. think about even in our own organization, when you're, when you're watching things decline, you're like, uh, this is bad and you know, it's gnarly. But when you get a couple of wins, you start getting some energy back under your sails, which gives you more energy and you can go faster. So it's, it's not just about selling. It's about the mojo in your organization and with your team members. Jennifer, I walked all over you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. I was just saying that a few people have joined us since we started. Uh, we are taking your questions. So use the chat box as an opportunity to ask anything you want. We have four coaches here that are in the thick of this day to day. Um, we've, we've, we're ready to share experiences with you. And, you know, Andy, you mentioned about getting the wind back in your sales and, and getting the team uh, back to a point where they are excited and motivated. How are you seeing, team on the screen, how are you seeing companies uh, make morale better without it being a happy hour on Zoom? Like, what's different? What can we do differently? I know we have an experience to share with Chip. If you still have your costumes, you can you can share those with us. <laughs> we got some pictures somewhere on the chat. Of, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the event we did uh, just the other day as a team, we had an organization come in um, and lead us through a team building exercise where we uh, they gave us three different movie uh, plots 
and we broke out into teams and actually had to build a skit to tell the story in two minutes. Um, uh, so just a two minute skit on uh, to tell the story of the movie. And we scoured our homes. We uh, went and found Zoom backgrounds. We did all other kinds of things. And it was a really great experience uh, just to get us in and having fun and laughing with each other. And, you know, it's not, it wasn't a happy hour. It wasn't a, a lunch and learn. It wasn't a, a, just an open Zoom or anything like that. It was very, uh, very much a, a, an organized activity. It was just fantastic. So that was one. Yeah, you know, somebody brought up after we did that exercise with our own team that we've kind of stopped laughing together and having fun together because things were stressful at the beginning and we're all separate. We're not in the office. And it brought a moment together so that we could be silly and just have some fun with each other at, you know, like we would if we were hanging out having drinks after work or after a conference, uh, poking fun with each other and just being, just being silly. That was the point of it. Mark, have you been seeing anything interesting that your clients and members are doing? Well, one of the things that was just as you were mentioning that I was just thinking about, uh, um, you know, how um, you know, you're saying that we haven't been laughing as much, right? Which I think is true. We have been, you know, it's, it, we've heard this thing of social distancing, right? And and unfortunately, we've done that. Uh, you know, well, I guess fortunately and unfortunately. Um, but you know, it's how do we bring that socialization back within a physical distancing? Is I think the opportunity for us, not a challenge, but an opportunity. And, you know, I do think it's important to do fun things. Uh, you know, at first we did the simple things of the, the Zoom, uh, you know, happy hours, but how are we going to be doing this with our, with our teams uh, and making it uh, something that's interactive and fun? I mean, the thing that, uh, that we did as, as Petra was, was cool. Um, you know, I, I've had uh, friends that are doing uh, you know, regular dinners, right? It's like, okay, they, they pass around the group. They're like, all right, we're the four of us going to get together and we're going to cook a dinner. And tonight I'm going to show you how to make this. And next week, Jennifer, can you show me how to make that? And, and it's been, you know, fun, even as, as workmates doing that. Uh, so, you know, having a good time doing those things. I think one thing that's important that I've seen is um, I think it's about not going to extremes. And what I mean by this is, you know, everything's not terrible and then everything's not all just laughing, right? It's okay to say, hey, you know what? Times are challenging. Be realistic. This is challenging. How can we make this a great opportunity and, and what can we do? And let's go, you know, make that happen. But recognizing the first part of it and then implementing the, the latter parts, whatever they may be. Andy, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll take a different tack. Um, As usual. We love uh, it. I think, I think, um, in the absence of information, there's fear, worry, and anxiety, right? In the absence of information, there's fear, worry, and anxiety. And up until, you know, I'll take Petra as a, you know, an example. Every other company that we work with is exactly the same. Up until that point, there was a plan. Everybody kind of knew what the path they were on. They knew what they needed to go do. Um, there was a known, right? And it was information. And all of a sudden it became very unknown and kind of scary and people were playing defense and um, tomorrow was different. We didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. So I think part of getting a team into a place of security, which allows them to have a feeling of happiness, a feeling of um, stability and allows them to laugh again is to get some sort of a structure of what the future is going to look like for an organization. And, you know, and we spent time in this short term, long term, as you guys are very aware on this call and you know, being pretty constructive in what those things are going to look like, um, putting some targets out there. This is what we teach all the people that we work with and then communicating that back to an organization. So they, they have some semblance of an idea that we're back on a path towards success uh, and what success actually looks like so that they can stabilize a bit and get themselves to a place where they allow themselves to go have some of that fun. So with that information, you know, with the absence of, informa of information, there's fear. How are we, how's the best way for, for our teams that we work with and those who are listening today on Facebook and on the, the attendees on the webinar, how's the best way to get that information driven through the organization? I think the biggest thing, the first thing is repetition. Um, get, get it on paper and drill it home because the again in the absence of information and what we're seeing more is because we are not in close proximity we have to repeat things more and more often so that people 
not only hear it, but understand exactly what we're talking about. And it could be any level of thing. It could be simple things from HR policies, uh, policies to complex business strategies, uh, you know, of, of pivoting or attacking uh, the, a, the, a new market. Um, it's just getting it on paper and drilling it home. You're going to have to repeat things more than you would like to right now because of the lack of proximity, the physical proximity that we're in. Mark, any thoughts on that? I, I think I'm going to echo similarly, and and I know working with uh, you know the businesses and members that 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 I am is is about really being <clears throat> consistent with those rhythms and communication, right? Making sure that everybody knows that hey, we're doing our daily huddles. You know, just because we're not in the office doesn't mean uh, we're going to get lax on that. And I think as leaders, we need to you know really guard that and understand that uh, our, our team is looking for that. You know, Andy's absolutely right, is that, you know, in the absence of information, this fear and anxiety, and our, our team members are sitting out there not knowing. And it's hard, it's new, it's weird, right? And what they are looking for is consistency. They're looking for the known. Uh, you know, there's an old uh, saying that, that we had in uh, uh, the entrepreneurs organization, which several of us have been a part of, but oh, uh, on the board there, we said, yeah, mm -hmm. What was that? So I thought you were going to say uh, there's an old saying in ski school. <laughs> no, no, no. But Gina said that yesterday. I love that one alone. But, uh, you know, we said on the board that if you don't fill the chalkboard, everybody else will fill it. And they usually don't fill it with the information you want. It's the same type of thing. So regular communication. What are those rhythms of communication? And figure out how to even up those. Uh, you know, at, at Petro, one of the things we did was, you know, we, we have a daily huddle, but we went to, you know, three and then two a day huddles. Uh, as this progressed, just because it was important to make sure we stayed connected. Yeah, I think one of the ways, if you are already doing a daily huddle, if you are already have weekly rhythms, look at what those rhythms are and reevaluate if they are working in your new environment. And one of the ways that we can learn how to be better at a huddle, and it brings everyone's ideas to the table, is every time a company, we teach our members every time they end a daily or a weekly huddle, especially if they've just started doing it, is to score it. And I think this can be one of the most powerful um, ways to improve a daily or a weekly huddle is to say, on a scale of zero to 10, how was this meeting? And if you scored anything below a nine, you have to give one reason that, of why you think it can improve, why you scored it that way and what the improvement is. And that gets everything out on the table from the whole team to say, well, you know, Sarah never fills in her huddle or Chip never fills in his huddle on time. And so I can't prepare. Whatever that looks like, it allows everyone to say, let's all get better together. It could be a really powerful tool. I can tell Chip Andy usually, wants Chip <laughs> usually fills his in and just does it after 930 at night. Um, so, so that scoring system is, is a good idea. So you do that at the very end of the huddle, obviously. So you got to kind of recap it. And um, now that we have visual with everyone on screens, you can do like fist to five, right? So there's ways to do that in a, a fun format. You can use chats, you can use polling. There's some other pieces that you can use. So make sure that you are scoring it. Um, I, I put the word visual down when you ask the question, how do you drive it through an organization? Um, you know, I, I struggle with this particular point and you, you guys hear me on huddles all the say, like I'm gonna I'm hear myself repeat myself again. Cause I say things 15 times and I'm like, I just said that yesterday, but I'm going to say it again. You guys listen up prior to COVID. I would just turn to the whiteboard and I would draw a picture of it. Right. So that, that's the way I would communicate is through a visual. If I'm working with the leadership team, we'd be in the room together and I would, you know, I'd say this, you know, there's the I'd use colors and lines and all, you know, like there was this painting that came of it as I, as I kind of talk to people. Um, so I think finding ways to make things visual, um, I pulled out an old iPad that I had from, it doesn't even have the new plug. I don't know how, how old the damn thing is, uh, but to have the ability to uh, log into zoom on the iPad and then use, use it as a, a separate screen. So I can make that the primary and, and do the background and actually almost like a whiteboard would be, um, begin to do some more visual communication. Um, and I, I just had a conversation with um, a company that's that's tying scores of meetings back to incentive. So, so my, my 
as the coach, I was talking to them about carrots and sticks, right? So it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, you guys need some additional structure in this stuff, but you know, you don't do anything when somebody doesn't show up and it never really happens. So you're going to have to get a lot more diligent in how you, you know, use a stick to get somebody to do the things you want them to do. Well, Hey, if your team says your meetings suck, you probably don't get as much compensation because part of your job is to ensure you have productive meetings. I mean, that's what we're talking about there. I got a question for you. How do you think that work from home uh, being, do you, first of all, do you think that's a long-term trend and why? And secondarily that where are the opportunities, obstacles, and how will businesses need to change to fit into that? Mm. That's a great question. You know, I think, I do think this is going to be long-term, Andy. I think it's going to maybe last until 2021. We were just talking before we started that Google's employees are working at home through the end of the year. Twitter has gone into, for the, at least the foreseeable future. Yeah, sure. Say that again. Went off the deep end. Yeah, they're going, and, and, but they are, and, and this is going to be a long-term thing, uh, especially as people phase into their new working environments. If they're, if they were in cubes, and now not everybody can be in there, and, and you're phasing people in and out on a schedule, um, people are going to be working from home. The obstacles we're facing are, you know, the work from home environment might not be ideal for productivity. So how are we supporting our team members uh, with that? Um, the opportunities with it are, you know, an example of that would be, you know, that we, we do have a little bit more flexibility in our schedule and, and um, we, this could actually be a really good thing. You don't have to lease as much office space, you know, all those things play into um, this new work from home environment. Mark, uh, Chip, what are you guys seeing? Or I see a no, uh, 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 go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, Andy, going to your question, you know, I absolutely think this is, you know, fundamentally changed how we're going to do business across the board forever. I, I don't think we'll go back to not having uh, some type of work from a distance type of component in all businesses. I, I think what's, um, you know, we saw it some at, at Petra in the offerings that we had, um, and now what we're doing. I, I think what I'm seeing with some of the members that I'm working with is, <clears throat> there used to be a, some friction in work from home. It was like, oh, that never works for me. Oh, I don't know how to use technology or, you know, what's this Zoom thing or do we use Zoom or do we use, you know, XYZ product? And that was just, you know, resistance. It's normal human nature of, oh, well, just go to what I know. And what I know is show up at the office, show up to my cube and we get things done. Well, COVID has, has managed to reset our expectation and say, this is, not that hard and people got used to it and we can have some fun with it. And, and I think the, you know, the opportunity is for us to engage a larger workforce. I mean, I, I think that there are businesses that are now going to be able to bring people onto their team that they didn't have access to before. Somebody like, you know, one of our members, they do a, you know, women back to work program and how do they get, you know, women who have gone out to have a family want to come back that's a great opportunity for companies that might not have had that before. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it will be uh, a huge benefit to those companies who look at it as an opportunity, not an obstacle. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that, but I think we're going to continue to see a lot more as we go forward. And if you ignore it, it will bite you in the butt. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the, the big thing on, on several fronts, number one, we are going to have to figure out how to measure productivity in a much different way. What does that look like? Um, what are we willing to live with in terms of productivity because of the re remote thing? And we've even seen on our team, team members with young children um, who don't have access to childcare um, are going to just be less productive because of what we're dealing with in a stay at home situation. Once child care opens up, that's going to be a different, uh, a different story to relieve them of, of that uh, demand on their schedule. I see other things uh, in terms of opportunities. One of the companies I coach is a physical therapy firm uh, down in, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and they're looking at things like ergonomic programs for uh, d new things that might emerge in terms of uh, posture or 
uh, or sedentary lifestyle or these kinds of things to open up for companies to come in and do one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling and, and coaching with um, uh, their, their team members about those kinds of unique things they're going to face if they have not been remote before. Um, another thing is I think there's going to be a whole uh, um, industry of catering to remote f workforces that's going to open up, not just in, in delivering meals, but having that coordinated effort, you know, a, a service like to be able to send everybody a, a, on your team a, a, a coffee card to go, to, to go have coffee one day or to jointly have a collective meal that can somehow all uh, 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 arrive at the same time so everybody could could have like a, a family meal together as a team and other things it could be book distribution but I, I do see an opportunity an industry opportunity to come in and specifically cater to these businesses who are going to be for the most part remote for the for the near term midterm and that's going to change vacation policy too. You know, Andy stealing this from your Facebook posts uh, earlier this week. Look at that. Yeah, PTO. Uh, what? And I know you had some. You asked your your Facebook friends, followers. You know, what does PTO look like? What are you thinking about? And and I don't know if you got any updated answers, but how are you guys thinking this is going to change PTO and vacation policy? It's you know, going like, to change it. Like, what does it even mean anymore? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. What, and then in the short term, like, what's going to happen if your vacation starved employees who've been locked in their homes for the past three months all want to take their accrued PTO at one time? You know, can you res limit or restrict them from taking that PTO all at the same time? Um, you, you can do whatever you want to do. You just need to do it smartly, right? You know, the, the, well, it's all the way you communicate it. Yeah. I mean, but I'm not so sure in, in September you want your entire staff jumping on airplanes and going places either. So, I mean, there's, there is a, a bit of common sense that goes into play through all this, but if you've got, if a company has PTO, you know, guidelines that say things like you get three weeks a year based on tenure. I mean, what is, what does the three weeks a year mean anymore? Right. You may be able to keep the three weeks a year, but it used to mean you don't come in the office. Well, hell you don't come in the office now. Well, so what is, mm -hmm. what does it actually mean? There will need to be some level of restructuring. Um, we've got a lot of organizations and this one I was talking about in the huddle the other day is looking at unrestricted PTO. So it's a chips point. However, um, and, and we've seen this, we worked with a company that, you know, kind of came in one day and said, Hey, we have unrestricted PTO and the place went nuts because they did not have productivity measures. Right. So you can't have one without the other. You can't have, Oh, we're going to just going to give you a take time as you need time as you know, unrestricted um, without guidelines of, do you have all your work done? <laughs> and do you have shifts covered? Um, you know, all of those things come into play. So it's, you, you can't have one without the other. And PTO is going to be a challenge. The whole, um, I just had a call earlier today. There's about a thousand person employee, a thousand person team. Um, they did a survey and said, um, how are you doing working from home? Do you want to return to the office? Do you want to stay at home? Or, or, you know, do you want to mix? And it was 200 people said we, we want to return to the office. 200 people said we're going to work from home. We're not ever coming back to the office. Um, and 600 people said we'd like to have a mix. Two days, three days, three days, two days, something like that. So that's probably a pretty good kind of view to what every single organization is, is dealing with. You got about, you know, 20% on one end and 20% on the other, and the rest are kind of stuck in the middle. Um, we have team members that are dying to get back in the office too. They're usually the ones that like people a lot and they want to be around people all the time. Um, you know, I, I don't mind working here by myself. It's totally cool with me. So I, there will need to be thoughtful structures in the future about how you, how you, adapt to this as an organization and you will need to adapt again if you ignore it you're going to find that you're going to lose everybody mm -hmm. because there will be other people who have adapted to it and do a better job with it and your team members are going to be gone mm -hmm. I, I, I i totally i totally agree and i think it's also when we look at it right the concept of paid time off right when you really think about where it came from it came from an industrial era Right. Of, OK, you're in a job, you're doing something, you're at a factory, you, you know, got to be there. And, you know, how do we give people, you know, a respite from that? And 
we still have to look at how we give our team members respites, right? How do we get them to, you know, refresh and, and, and get their minds away? But it's a different mindset when we're in, you know, the type of economy, you know, global economy that we have now. And I think, Andy, to your point is, we're, you know, this has forced us to even look at it harder of what does leave mean, right? What does paid time off mean? And I, I, again, I think it's a great opportunity and the members I've been working with of, hey, this is giving us a blank sheet of paper. What is it that we feel our team could, you know, gain from by really taking a good hard look and starting from scratch? Uh, Gina yesterday, who we had on the on the fireside chat was saying that. It's like, wow, what an opportunity when everything goes to zero, right? To say, what do we really want it to be and start and build from there? And you know, leaders will see that as an opportunity and take the, the steps to move it forward and attempt this, attempt that, see what works better. Um, but we're going to have to make an adaptation on this whole what is, you know, paid time mm -hmm. off in some way. Yeah, yeah. I had a, a member talk about that this morning um, a, a, about because they are their revenue is generated hourly. So the full staff or technology company there, it's all dependent on being, you know, being them billing somewhere between seven and eight hours of time each day. And so their PTO implications, what they're worried about is that they may give the staff a window and it could very well affect a, 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 the entire quarter's numbers. Um, and, and Chip, you're going to, every organization will have to rethink their entire absolutely. Operation. Right. So when you're talking about something like that, where it's hourly build in order to, to, to survive in the future, you may not be able to have hourly build employees. You may have to do it completely differently than you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. right. I guarantee you, I don't know who that, who that company is, but I guarantee you the owner of that business has sat around for the last three years thinking about how not to do by the hour. How do I get recurring revenue? How do I get bit? Like they've been thinking about this stuff for a decade. Yep. And now's the time to make that shift. But all the operations will have to change. I mean, we've had to change our operations a ton uh, with people. Every single thing that we do will be different in the future because of work from home. So we've had two questions come in. Um, one says, do you think it's a bad idea to tell your employees we will be working from home through the end of the year? Or is it better to say through August and readdress it in August? If I had a coin, I'd just flip it right <laughs> I don't know. Like, if it were me, so if I put myself in that employee's shoes and look at it through their, their eyes, and look, I know that I'm the planner of this group, right? I like to see around the curves big time. I want to know how, like, how I need to prepare my home. You know, do I need to go get a more sturdy desk and a better office chair because this isn't temporary anymore? What do I need to do for childcare? Do I need to set up a nanny share program? You know, whatever that looks like um, so that I can be more productive. I need to know if that's long-term or short-term. If I can still deal with this for another couple months, maybe I'm okay. But if this is through the end of the year, I think it's important to be transparent um, with, our, with our teams and really upfront, knowing that it could change, right? What do you I think say? what you just said is the operative thing is Take into the con into context what is long and short term for you. There are there are companies right now now where long term is thirty days because of the volatility. Now it's starting to wane a little bit um, as we're coming uh, getting on the other side of the curve of this thing. But uh, I, and I think that that's the operative thing. Decide what's a long term time frame and focus your message in in the end the time of that around whatever that is for you as an organization. And then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think Jennifer, you nailed it, which is, uh, I think uh, as leaders in, in our organizations, we have to share what we know and what we don't know, right? It's like, Hey, if we know that it's going to be at least until the end of August, you know, communicate. I mean, if you know you're going to be like Google said, hey, we're going to do it to the end of the year, they know. I mean, one of the things we were on here talking about before, the state of California is, that's where, where I reside, the state of California is taking a hard stance on this. They're putting, they're making businesses responsible uh, for, you know, if someone gets sick, it's their responsibility as a business to determine or to prove that they did not get sick at the office. 
the the thinking there is that they want to make sure that businesses are are being very very thoughtful before they bring people back together as such google said we're just going to make the blanket statement that we're not coming back they said it's past the end of the year they said february of next year um so you know they know that if you know it uh you know then communicate that say hey you know what based on this uh, and what we do we're, we're not going to be coming back into the office uh until the end of the year if you don't know Hey, we, you know, I can see as a leader that it's going to be till August and it might be past that. And as we get more information, we'll let you know. Um, but yes, get a comfortable chair, um, you know, or, or do what you need to do. Yeah, ask your boss for a comfortable chair. Um, and Google's, you know, as well as I do, Mark, Google's got employees coming to that office 24 seven. Like there's a segment of them that can work from home. There's a segment of them that can't work from home. And then there's a segment that could work from home. Right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they got to, they would have to, I don't even know what they would have to do, but they'd have to drastically change their business model to have zero people coming to their campus. Same is true for most businesses. There's going to be in our, you know, Janelle has to go to the office to ship stuff. There are things that are in the, you know, could and can't and can categories. Um, yeah. We've chosen to kind of follow over in Tennessee, but we've chosen to kind of follow the guidelines of the state of Tennessee. So what's happening in our neighborhood, as Mark said, you know, thank God we're not in California. Uh, I'm a little strict out there. Uh, always has yeah. been. Um, but, you know, just kind of what's happening in the environment that's around you. If that happens to be August, pick August. If it happens to be the end of the year, pick the end of the year. Uh, you know, you can always make an adjustment. I mean, March 13th, you made a big adjustment. We did. Uh, you may have to make another one, but in the absence of information, there's anxiety, worry, and fear. So pick something and just go do it. And as you get closer to it, make your adjustments. Similar question that mm -hmm. was submitted in the Q and A. Our office has responded, oh, sorry. Our office has reopened for those employees that feel safe and want to come in. How do you stop the silos of communication is what I think they're saying here that will happen between those working together in the office and those who have chosen to stay remote. So that water cooler talk that happens and the information transfers face to face, making sure that it's also transferring to those who've decided to stay home. That's a good question. Yeah, I think Emily wrote this <laughs> um, and she disguised it by saying uh, our office has reopened because we don't reopen until the 18th. <laughs> I'm fully expecting to get a text from Emily any second. Now. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. You know. <laughs> expect that the opposite is true and that the in-person water cooler talk is also happening uh, with the remote people via text chat or whatever you use on as a back channel um, as andy points out quite often you can tell who's texting during a huddle because of the grimaces that that come up and and so it, I, I think both instances are true and uh, i had actually had a conversation with a member yesterday who uh, they just returned to work on Monday, and some of this has already happened. And I said in, to to the member leader, the CEO, you have to, you are going to have to be more diligent in policing this, much like you do with your children. You cannot let these things linger. When you see it, say something. You have to address it because the culture that you had prior to you know, first March, mid-March, whenever it was, is now completely different. And you are, you are the one person who is going to dictate what you are willing or not willing to tolerate in terms of behavior. So address it quickly. And repeat yourself quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, Andy? <laughs> um, yeah, and I would say get used to it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you, you know, we, we've been working in a remote environment for years. We've had team members like Mark who are West coasters and then we have Nashville, right? So it's like Nashville against the West or West against Nashville. <laughs> so there's a piece of what this question implies that is just the natural course of being a human being and it ain't going to change. Now you can attempt to change it. Um, I've attempted to change it for nearly a decade now. Um, and there's a sum of it. How's that working for you? Yeah, man. I mean, it's like, um, 
you should address it. You should have conversations. You do have to repeat yourself a lot. You need to get yourself some guidelines and standards that says, this is not what we do. It's not how we act. Um, and just realize that, you know, the West coast is still going to be the West coast and they're going to do what they're going to do regardless of what the hell you say to a degree. What's he saying, Mark? What's he saying about you? Yeah, I, hey, totally he says I'm going to be who I'm going to be, right? But uh, you know, I think I, I, I will, and that I will agree totally. Is that, and I think as organizations, what we do is, you know, we get out in front of that and create a great environment. I mean, yes, um, you know, I, I, I'm out on the West Coast and not in Nashville, but I, there is nothing that I love better than getting to Nashville, being there. I want to be there. Yeah, there's distance and some of that, you know, you do, it's natural human nature. But I, I think what I'd say is create that culture and environment where, you know, people don't want to build the silos. They want to be as close as they can be. Right. Uh, working from, you know, Andy, you said it, what are the values? And when you have people who are in alignment with your core values and you can communicate those, then the silos are less. They don't go away. Right. That is somewhat human nature, but they become less. And sometimes they become more fun. Right. It's like, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, Jason and I have a, you know, a direct Listen, texting. So you drove the Jason Coast too. I didn't have, I didn't bring Jason up. You brought him all the way. I did. I did. <laughs> exactly. I'm bringing him into the fold. Listen right now. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, he's calling it, it, me. What did he do? Yeah. <laughs> did he move to he Washington heard, State? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I think it's, you know, take advantage of that human nature a little bit and, you know, find those people who, uh, you know, resonate with the culture you have. And then there's l less of it. It doesn't go away. All right. I'm changing the subject because this is a question I've been getting. You're, you're welcome, Jason and Mark. You're welcome. We can <laughs> <laughs> so, keep going, I'm fine. Yeah, all right. I've been getting this question within like the past 48 hours-ish. Should I or should I not keep my PPP loan? I've had several members that mm -hmm. I coach on our check-in calls um, asking about the required certifications for the PPP and what disclosures there will be about PPP participation. And as a result, whether members or clients should take advantage of the safe harbor to return the payroll protection plan funds. And you know, deadline wise is May 14th, that's tomorrow. Now, the other thing that we don't have clarity on is, is that tonight at midnight tomorrow or is that tomorrow tomorrow? Well, um, there, was a, there was just guidelines pushed out about an hour ago. Good. Um, for a $2 million threshold. Mark, you might be, you know, even more on top of this, but, um, you know, IRS guidelines said they we're going to, we're going to pay attention to the $2 million plus people. So the first thing would be, uh, is it less than 2 million? Do I need to pay attention to it if it's less than 2 million? In my opinion, the second would be, um, if you, if you're questioning yourself, like you receive dollars, and you're questioning, should I return it? Not be under threat, like not under threat, um, but under like morality reasons, right? Maybe, maybe you should. Well, it's all about going back to the intent of the act, right? The intent was yeah. to, to provide liquidity for companies to be able to pay their payroll. So, you know, what I was talking to this member about yesterday was you have to justify, not necessarily prove Go back to the intent. You should be, um, at the time of the loan. Yes. That's documenting the these specific conclusions that led to your necessity, what you felt was your economic necessity, especially as it relates to payroll. Um, and those things, what are those things that you did to consider that, you needed to sign on that dotted line to accept that application or submit that application. Memorialize that, you know, those questions that you asked yourself. Uh, and, you know, we should expect that also this is going to be um, publicly disclosed, potentially in a searchable database also. So, you know, what does that look like? Mark, I'm going to stop talking and let, let our resident PPP expert <laughs> shed some light on it. Yeah, and, and what what I would say is is you're hitting right uh, spot on on the things that I've been communicating to a lot of people because we're doing these government assistance workshops and and we've been doing this uh, you know David Pierce and, and Greg Eisen and myself you know having dug through a lot of it um, you know what I communicate to people is that 
you know what, this came on so rapidly and, you know, our government, you know, got out there quickly. Did they think it all the way through? No, they did not. And I, what I would tell you is that the intent of the law and the way it was written, and I had, I read all three of the documents, you know, in total, probably about 2000 pages worth of documents. When it was first written, there was no need required to apply. It was simply, we're going to put out money out there. If you have a business and you want to keep paying your people, we are offering this, put in your application. They have since thought about it a little bit and said, well, wait a second, maybe that wasn't the smartest thing to do. We want to communicate that it really should be for people who are in need. Andy, to your point, if as a business leader, you're saying, you know what, I, when it first came out, I just put my application in like everybody else. And now that I understand they're moving you know, the, the line a little bit saying, hey, it really should be for need. If you've got the money and you're like, you know what, I don't really fall in that category, then, you know, it does become a moral question is, okay, you know, look at like the you know, Los Angeles Lakers, you know, they got it. The law did not prevent them from applying at all. Uh, they were not in, in, in the wrong. When it came out that, hey, this is really for people who are in need, they, you know, they had a lot of kickback and they refunded the money. Uh, and I, I do think it's taking a look at what the intent was when you applied and then what it is meant to be now and where you're at. And, you know, I, I think companies that have the wherewithal should be using those, those resources that they have if you don't be so that others that do need it can get to it. The idea is to make sure that we come back from what is a catastrophic, catastrophic event around the globe. That's and little, how do we do good. our part? There's a little bit of interpretation in, even in that comment, right, Mark? So mm. uh, if you think about um, the ones that have the wherewithal should be using it, right? Um, well, th would that put them in some kind of a situation that wouldn't allow them to, to continue business or grow business after this? Does it, like, nobody on the planet caused it. Like, well, somebody on the planet caused it, but we didn't cause it, right? So this was, this was done as a product of our environment. It's not like we made a mistake somewhere and we ended up, you know, losing 2 million bucks in revenue, right? It's not, so, you know, you know that, that's a big hole to go dig yourself out of in a short period of time. And if we used resources that we had available to us to go do that, any business, um, does that screw the business a year from now? Does it, you know what I'm saying? Like even, even in yeah. that mindset, there's, yeah, I mean, think it's very, about it's a very complex question, right? And think, oh, yeah. about it. and it depends on your your individual situation. You know, document, document, document the reasons why, the questions that you asked, the conclusions that you came to to say, "I need this." You know, think about companies that have a really long lag time, um, like an insurance company or something like that. But right now, they may not need it right now, but six months from now, they may need it because there's such a lag. Uh, development is such a lag like when, uh, real estate there things are going okay right now in real estate but real estate listings are are shrinking there's a there's there aren't there isn't enough inventory so they may need to have saved the cash that they did have access to in march april june for april may or april um sorry september is what i'm trying to say <laughs> september october mm -hmm. november i don't know what month it is anymore guys I think that nobody the big, does. To me, Jennifer, the in between the lines of what the question's intent is, is an, is another one, and that is, I, I see it. I've had more conversations around this than than any around PPP. Is there's a there's a people who get it feel like there's a need to spend it all. And 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 my advice to them is spend what you need. And then either convert it to a, to debt, or repay it at the end of the year, sixty days. It feels like too many people who have gotten this ha are treating it like free money, when they need to be treating it like a loan, a true loan, that yeah may be forgivable, but approach it like a loan, and spend it wisely. Oh, and, and I think uh, we talked about it uh, on a previous one of these, Chip, is that, you know, don't let, uh, you know, the receipt of these monies uh, allow you to make bad business decisions, no matter mm -hmm. what, right? Make the right business decisions. And 
if within those business decisions you have the opportunity to take advantage of the forgiveness in the PPP loan, right? You're right, it's a loan. But if you if making those right decisions, you have the opportunity to um, get some forgiveness, then that's awesome, right? Then do that. Um, if you don't, then uh, you know don't make a bad business decision. Don't attempt to you know figure out how to spend all this money just to do that. That will get called into question. I, I, I guarantee you, if you're above the $2 million, I do agree that, you know, there's a lot of loans out there. Um, you know, are they going to get to everybody? No. But, uh, you know, it comes back to do the right thing uh, business-wise uh, and then work within the rules. Something like 50,000 of these were over over $2 million. Wow. Yeah. If, there's, if, if that's the threshold for an investigation, that's a massive amount of work. I mean, I've been talking with people who are under that and they're, you know, concerned. And I mean, again, I think it, I think Andy, I think your point is very valid is, it, you know, I know as a business owner, I always look myself in the mirror. How do I, you know, go through this, you know, understanding that, Hey, I, I did this because I did see an economic need for my company either now or in the future, right? That's where I made my request on the loan. Uh, I'm, I'm good with that. I am. If I have to sit in front of anybody, I have no problem communicating that if they, if they do tell me in the future that that's not, you know, doesn't meet the standard, some of the, the challenges too is that we don't know what the challenges will be, right? What, what's going to come back out of this? My belief, uh, again, this is a Mark Comiso having read it, uh, is that if it's determined that you didn't meet the threshold, I believe it'll turn into a loan unless you were fraudulent in how you were using it. And then the case is, okay, I just need to repay this money. I used it in my, what I thought was the best interest. I will mm -hmm. then pay the money back. So also, uh, please additionally seek the advice of your attorney and your accountant. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I am not an attorney or an accountant. That's got, a little, and I'm on the words. west coast. And I'm on the west coast, so you never know, right? Man, I got you guys fired up with that question. Anybody? I got a question. Go yeah, go for it. So I've had this come up twice in the last week. When's the right time? to do a, t a post mortem meeting on how our organization addressed everything related to uh, what we did in around the, the pandemic. And what are some good questions that we should be asking our team to get better when and if this ever happens again? Andy? So my, my people hear me say this to them, why do you wanna do a post mortem? Like that'd be the first thing to, to answer the question is at really ask, why are we doing this? Right. And if you can, if you, if you can answer why we're doing it, that may give you guidance of what the timeline is to actually do it. It's the outcome. What outcome are you looking mm -hmm. for from that postmortem? Um, you know, we do this in our planning days with members. We say, let's review what happened last quarter. And then we go into planning the next quarter. And we use the survey to do that. Um, you know, so maybe part, one of those questions is what lessons have you learned? Uh, and, and how do we need to, to continue learning or do we need to continue with what we're doing or shift? I you guys, and I, I, I have a chance to look at this. Oh yeah. 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 So th this is a really, it worked out really well. Like the, the, cause I've read through this a few times now. And I'm like, I would have forgot half the stuff that was in there, maybe more, right? But it was, it was kind of a cool what timeline. What is that for the team, for the, those who don't know what that is? For, it's a secret, so we <laughs> can't tell everybody. Now, this is a case study from the very first day that the word COVID came up. And everything that we did up until, I want to say, like, April, the end of April. Day by day by day by day by day. So all the, all, and, the and, all the shifts and all the decisions and all the communication, everything we did. Um, so when you're do, looking for a postmortem, it would be helpful if you had this because you can just you, look back and read over it. You asked someone within our organization to just document every single piece of con like internal and external communication as it relates to COVID decisions that were made when we started and stopped doing two a day huddles, all of that stuff, how, how communication rhythms, rhythms changed, everything's documented, right? Exactly. I just wanted, yeah, I, I felt like it was, uh, I mean, you read, you read stories of people that wrote journals during times of conflict or crisis, 
and they look back at them and, you know, we read them today as literature, right? So I felt like this ain't going to probably happen again for a while. Let me, let me make sure we get this thing down on paper because it'll be a cool little look back. So that's, that was the thought process. It was about that short, like most of the things I've come up with. I, I was going to add to it and say, you know, Chip, a, a great question. I, I, you know, I don't like the term postmortem, right? That means something's dead. I, I think this is living, right? This is, this is ongoing. It's, you know, it's that idea. And, and I have one member, a East Coast member, huge. They have 1,500 people. We have, you know, their organization broken into eight groups. And each one of the groups has a priority this quarter to put documents in place of the things that they're learning right? It's, they put it up, all of them said, this is so important to us to make sure we don't lose this institutional knowledge of what's going on. Some of it's related to what we talked about, of how does work from home now, what's working, what's not working? You know, what things did we learn that we never even thought of? What are new sheets of paper that we're filling out? All those things are, are now becoming part of their, you know, Andy, to your point, their history, right? But they're going to be able to reference it because if they, they go down the road six months or a year or three years from now, it's like, what do we do back then? Why do we do it? And, you know, we fill in our own answers at that point. So I, I like the idea of, hey, make this something that you're looking at as how do we gain this knowledge and keep it? Not, oh, let's look back and just remember what died. Mm -hmm. Well, I think all of it is around, you know, the, the why in the two instances I had has been, we didn't have anything. And it's like, the, the, the why to have this is to get things on a piece of paper when a disaster, when a crisis situation happens, you can pull that out and go, here is the checklist. Here are the things that we've done. Here's what worked. Uh, and here's how we are going to proceed through the first week, second week, on to however long um, in order to get all of those things on paper. And as we've said before, you, you go back and look at the exercises we've done, um, specifically around doing SWAT, uh, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. No one had a pandemic that I, I know the members that I coach didn't have. There was never a mention of a, a, a pandemic in the, in the T column uh, on that exercise. And so preparing for it, um, because I have a feeling that this isn't going to be the, the last time. We're, we're not done with dealing with COVID-19, in my opinion. And I, I do think that we're maybe on the, uh, not done dealing with health-related things like this. Um, you know, over the next decade. So we'll see. Be prepared. Any closing thoughts as we come up on uh, the top of the hour? Mark, you want to close us out? Your thoughts? We'll go to Chip. Um, yeah, I think my closing thoughts uh, are around, you guys have heard it, but I, I do love sharing it, is that, you know, these are some great questions. It's great to, to get on here and chat with you all and, uh, and do this. Um, but but I do think that as we're continuing to move through this, right, it's, you know, it's not the end, but we're continuing to move through it is remembering that, uh, you know, while we do have to be physically distant, we need to figure out how to keep doing these social connections. How do we share information? I mean, I, I am super proud of, you know, this organization at Petra where we've just put a lot of stuff out there. We're like, hey, you know what? This is a time when we've got to get more out there. We've got to share the things we have. So, you know, my, my closing comment is, you know, be physically distant, but not socially distant. Socially connect. Share with others. Share what you know. Share that it's hard. Share that you're having a birthday. Whatever it may be, share a lot. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, Mark. Thanks. I'd say the thing for me is uh, I've got two companies who are, who uh, have just in the last few days brought their teams back and make sure that you are getting counsel and advice on exactly how you need to do that to protect not only yourself, but also your company in, in that you, you don't just invite people you laid off back into the organization. There's a process and it varies from state to state on how you need to do that to make sure that it's, it's nice and neat and everything's buttoned up. And the same thing if you had furloughed people. Furloughed people need to be reinvited into the organization in a, in a, in a, a specific manner to make sure that that reentry is buttoned up and, and done to the letter of the law so that you're protecting yourself and your organization moving forward. Um, and in, then it also may have some implications with those people that you have re-asked to, to join your organization and didn't um, as it relates to PPP forgiveness. We'll see how that really goes later on. 
but make just make sure you're getting that all buttoned up uh, and, and doing it correctly to, to restart your company as you're reinviting people back in. But I'll, I'll build on that and I'll make one additional comment, but, um, and that's like the tactical legal, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer, but Mark is comment. Um, <laughs> think about, and Keith Frazzi has a great, he's got a couple of webinars out. I think we've all been webinar smacked around, but, he talks about recontracting with your teams. So the, the skill sets, the attitudes, potentially even the value sets on the other side may have shifted and you're going to expect different things from your team members as you begin to return. Hence the question of where the silo is going to be. Um, so it may also be that you need to recontract with them. What are the, what are the changes and how, what are the expectations that are new that didn't exist um, prior to, prior to the pandemic, PP as we call it. Um, what was your question again, Jan? I just wanted you to close this out. Any, any uh, final, you know? Oh man, I had something good too. You go, you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll go and then I'll, okay. It's probably on a sticky note down on your desk somewhere. No, it's blank. I looked down there first. <laughs> yeah, to, that, to that point, oh, Andy, you know, okay. This isn't, thanks. This is the opportunity that you have to do this again, right? This is the, the perspective of I get to do this. I get to recontract with my team. I get to hit reset, not I have to. So that's perspective. Um, as we go through the next 30 days, what does that look like for you to have the opportunity to get to do things over again? You get a redo. You get a second chance uh, to build it how you want to build it and to, and to do things differently. And how are you preparing for that? Um, shameless plug, come to a workshop with us. We can help you figure out what that looks like. You can go to petracoach.com slash COVID-19 and sign up for those workshops um, and we can help you figure that out. After my shameless plug, I'm going back to Andy. You can close this out. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on what you said because I totally agree. And what I wrote down was it's time to take the long view. And I think um, most people get up and think about what do they got to get done today, right? Some people think up, wake up and get up and say, what do I got to get done this week? Rare people wake up and say, what do I need to get done this month or this quarter or this year? And during this time of um, disruption, most of us have, I, I equate it to when I go to do those 14ers, you know, we, we start at 3 a.m., 3.30 a.m. We put a headlamp on because it's pitch black dark in the woods. And literally all you can see is about three feet in front of you. Like you're just watching your feet the entire time for the first four hours that you're kind of on the trail. And we've kind of been in that tunnel vision for the last six to eight weeks, right? So everybody's gotten a little bit too used to what do I got to get done today? What do I got to get done today? What do I got to get done today? And, and as, especially leaders, um, you've got to get out the hell out of that. And, and I believe right now it's time to take even a longer view than the view that we were looking prior to this. So that, that even that three to five year maybe needs to go out to 10 because our world and the business community is never going to be the same. And, and people need to accept that and get in front of it now or they're going to get run over. So take the long view. Cool. Embrace it. Yeah. All right. Great chatting with y'all. It was fun. Can we cheer out of something? <laughs> long view. The long view. Long view. All right. Long view. <laughs> one, two, three. Long, long view. view. All right, we'll All see right. everybody. Yeah.